to go. So welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. I'm Sarah, your host, and I'll shortly be handing over to Dr. Elizabeth Price. And Dr. Price is consultant rheumatologist at the Great Western Hospital in Swindon, and she's also BSA medical president and trustee. So Dr. Price, if you'd like to share your screen with us. Yes. Okay, before I go any further, can I just check that you can all see that? Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Okay, so thanks very much, Sarah, um, and welcome to everybody um, to this webinar. So my plan is to chat through um, some self-help ideas, things that you can do um, by explaining a little bit about the underlying mechanism of the disease to give you an idea of how you can look after yourself. Um, and then if you have a burning question, if you put it into the chat function, Sarah's going to keep an eye on the chat function through the talk and then will read back to me the, some of the questions at the end. And apologies if we don't get to everybody, but hopefully we'll cover the main themes. So, okay. So Sarah shouted at me if that's not working. So how can you help yourself? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it's really important you understand your condition. You understand what causes Sjogren's and that helps you rationalize how you can treat it yourself and how you can manage it. And it is, we have to be honest with you, a, a condition that requires a lot of self-management. There is no cure for Sjogren's syndrome. And most of the treatments we use are pretty suboptimal. They help, but they don't get rid of it and they're not complete. Um, treatments so you often need to search around and find the things that work for you and manage your lifestyle and, and manage your medication yourself to a degree there are some lifestyle changes that you can use you can take that will help you in terms of conserving the few secretions you produce um, and stimulating secretions as well and finally it's really important with any chronic disease that you look at after your general health it's particularly important at the moment with covid around what we're seeing in hospitals is that people who are fit do far better and it's patients who are unfit and less well that struggle with this condition so i'm going to start at the top because that's the easiest place to start i'm going to start with the eyes which is the most visible part of sjogren's and often what has taken people to dentists to, to doctors and um, eye specialists in the first place so it's important to realize that in sjogren's the surface of the eye is not just dry it's actively inflamed so it isn't enough just to put drops in you will do other things as well to damp down the inflammation and keep your eyes in tip-top condition the other thing to remember about the eyes is all three layers of the tears involved it's not just the watery tears it's the other tears as well and the tears become very concentrated in patients with Sjogren's and actually the concentration of the tears is quite toxic to the surface of the eye. So I'm going to run you through the different bits of the surface of the eye because if you understand them, it will help you understand how to look after your condition. So this is a cross section through an eye, starting at the surface of the eye, running up through the watery layer of tears and right to the top to the surface oily layer. The oily layer at the top is produced by the meibomian glands and they're little glands that sit in your eyelids and they secrete a thin oily substance which lies on the top and that has two really important functions. First of all, it lubricates the eye. So when you blink, that oily layer um, smears across the surface of the eye and gives you lubrication. But secondly, it prevents the watery tears underneath evaporating. The watery tears are produced by the lacrimal gland up in the outer aspect corner of the eye, eye socket itself. And those watery tears are what you and I consider as tears. And they're what most of the eye drops replace. And um, you should have a nice thick layer of those. And then this at the bottom is the actual surface of the eye. And it's worth noting that the surface of the eye is not actually flat. If you look at it under a very powerful microscope, it's actually got little peaks and troughs in it. And there's, um, the reason for that is that those peaks and troughs increase the total surface area of the eye and allow the watery tears to cling on to the surface of the eye and stop them rolling off. You've also got attached to that those peaks and troughs a very thin mucus layer produced by the mucus glands within the cornea itself and again if that mucus layer is deficient 
the tears roll off the eye and when you understand that you understand what sometimes patients complain about they say they wore their eyes water the tears fall straight off that's because the mucus layer is not good and the the um, little um, peaks and troughs are blunted and they'll complain of scratchiness despite putting lots of watery tears in and that's because the oily layer is not efficient and you need to look after all these layers to keep your eyes healthy and to keep your um, eyes comfortable and the first thing to say, and many of you will know this, is that you must not have preservative containing eye drops and Sjogren's. And the reason for that is that if you constantly put preservatives into, the, into your eye, they will blunt these little villi, these little peaks and troughs here. The surface of the eye will become flatter and therefore less effective at holding the tears in. And it's also important to look after the oily layer. I mentioned at the beginning that eyes are inflamed as well as dry. And this little cartoon here is to give you a visual picture of the inflammation. So these cells, these blue cells, are the surface um, cells of the cornea. And in a normal person, they're all joined together with what we call little tight junctions, um, signified on here by those little three lines. But in patients with Sjogren's, these tight junctions come apart and inflammatory cells on the surface of the eye attack the, the cornea. And they release all these little red dots here, which... Um, uh, signify inflammatory cytokines. Inflammatory cytokines are little chemicals on the surface of the eye that cause inflammation. And in fact, um, there are now some very fancy tests that can measure these levels, these, in, these inflammatory um, markers in the tears and give us an idea of how inflamed the eye is. And the inflammation is quite characteristic of Sjogren's. So in a normal age-related dry eye, because dry eyes do get drier as we get older, you don't have the inflammation. But in a Sjogren's dry eye, you've got inflammation as well. And what we know is that concentrated tears, because your tears have evaporated, because you've got poor oily layer allow more inflammation to occur so this can become a bit of a vicious cycle you've got concentrated tears that causes inflammation that causes irritation and more concentration of the tears so when you're looking after your eye think about all three layers so just to run through it for the surface avoid preservatives the mucus layers produced by the surface we've got a healthy service surface you'll produce the mucus layer the watery layer is what you're replacing with conventional eye drops now there's a whole range of eye drops on the market and for most purposes it's a question of what suits you best as an individual i use a lot of sodium hyaluronate containing eye drops there's an awful lot of them on the market now uh, many of you will know Hilo tears and Hilo 40 but there's also things like Hydromed and many more and and there are some mi mi minor differences between them um, they have different concentrations of sodium hyaluronate and different preparations but it's really a question of finding the one that suits you um, most GPs will have access to a limited number of these drops but if you're asking for drops to start with in Sjogren's I would go for preservative free sodium hyaluronic containing the lower percentages which would be around about 0.1% are thinner and more refreshing the higher percentages 0.2 and 0.3% are thicker and longer lasting but probably a bit less refreshing and then don't forget the meibomian glands. Those are the oily glands in your eyelid producing that surface oily layer. And the best way of stimulating those and getting that working is to use a microwavable eye compress. That's very, very, very simple. You can buy them um, in a good um, chemist or online. Expect to pay around about 10 to 20 pounds, no more than that for them. They are reusable multiple times and um, the majority of them you pop them in the microwave for about 25 30 seconds and then you put them on your eyes now you do need to put them on your closed eyes for a minimum of seven minutes less than seven minutes doesn't work the heat doesn't penetrate the eyelid um, if you're on if you've got them on for less than seven minutes seven to ten minutes is the optimum time to use them ideally at least once a day best in the mornings if you can manage it but if you can do them twice a day that's even better and if you can't manage the mornings because you're rushing out of the house to work then obviously just the evenings but it is definitely worth doing and persevering 
Some people also find that the meibomian glands get blocked. And if you look with a magnifying glass at the edges, the roots of your eyelashes, you can see these tiny little holes, which are where the meibomian glands um, come out, little ducts onto your eye surface, they can get blocked. And you can, in some patients, get benefit by cleaning the eyelids. And to do that, the best thing is to use a cotton wool bud, um, either dipped in a solution of bicarbonate, so boiled water and a teaspoon of bicarbonate, or a commercial preparation called blefasol. Uh, and there are also um, commercial wipes and so forth available, but they are quite expensive and, and, and not always available on prescription. We've already talked about avoiding preservatives, very important. We've talked about replacing the watery and the oily layers. Another thing I use a lot of, um, and some of you may be on, is pilocarpine. Pilocarpine is an old-fashioned drug. It's been around for decades, but it can be helpful. It stimulates secretions. It's a very basic, very simple drug. It works by stimulating the muscarinic receptors that sit on the surface of all our secretory cells throughout our body. There are pros and cons to pilocarpine. The benefits are that if it does work for you, and it works in 70% plus of patients with Sjögren's, it stimulates your secretions, which are always better quality than artificial secretions. The other benefit is it can stimulate secretions in bits of you you can't get at, so throat, nose, etc., which are hard to get secretions into. The downside, and there's always a downside, is that it can stimulate your sweat glands, and it can make you sweaty and flushed. And some people People find it makes them run to the loo a bit as well. The trick with pilocarpine is to give it a go and start with a tiny dose. So it only comes in a five milligram tablet. Some people can manage to cut those up into smaller increments, into two and a half milligram half tablets. Start with one tablet or half a tablet once a day with food um, and give that a week or two for your body to get used to it before you try and go any higher. If you're starting pilocarpine for the first time, I would recommend you persevere for about a month before giving up and expect a tablet to last maybe four to six hours before the effect wears off and you need to take another one. So most patients taking it regularly will take it three or more times a day. Um, we also occasionally, we talked about this being an inflammatory eye, not just a dry eye. And that's why sometimes um, ophthalmologists and opticians would recommend that you have steroids, um, which are powerful anti-inflammatories to the surface of the eye, um, or possibly cyclosporin, which is um, a, a, an autoimmune um, drug that we use um, to damp down the inflammation. These can be really good in the right people. They're not suitable for everybody. There are obvious downsides. Steroids can cause high pressure in the eye and etc. So they do need to be supervised ideally by um, an ophthalmologist or a specialist optician, but they can be very helpful in the right people and they're often used as intermittent courses to damp down inflammation. There's a few new things you might want to hear about. Neither of these that I'm going to mention here are yet available um, as NHS treatments, but I know some of you will have been off and had them privately and, and there are certain clinics offering them at the moment. Um, and these are new and will probably become more widespread in the next few years. So intense pulsed light therapy and lipoflow therapy are both treatments designed to improve meibomian gland function. So if your optician or ophthalmologist has said that you've got particular problems with the meibomian glands, the oily glands, you might want to consider either of those. And then there are a few other treatments that are used, um, including occasionally a low-dose antibiotic if the uh, meibomian glands are particularly inflamed. I was going to move on to talk about mouth next. So I was going to talk a little bit about oral health, about mouth ulcers, tooth loss and thrush. So starting with mouth ulcers, um, dryness in your mouth can lead to mouth ulcers, partly because you get um, mechanical stress from teeth or dentures or food itself. Um, and the main thing about that is to keep the mouth moist and moisturized. Now, I'd have to be honest with you and say that many of the over-the-counter treatments or the prescribable treatments for a dry mouth are not great. Um, most of them don't contain fluoride because there's a, um, a requirement that they go through testing if they have fluoride in them. So most of the manufacturers have taken the fluoride out. But, but it's a question of finding something that works for you. Many people just drink water. If you yourself find any of the commercial preparations, there's quite a lot on the market, things like buying 
bioteam, bio extra helpful, then do continue to use them. Um, one thing I sometimes see is that patients get mouth ulcers because they have a reaction to the SLS. SLS is sodium lauryl sulfate, and it's an ingredient in lots of things, particularly toothpastes. Um, and SLS itself can cause mouth ulcers in some people. So if you're getting recurrent mouth ulcers and have tried everything else, have a look at the labels on your toothpaste and other treatments and see if you can source some that are SLS free. So for instance, Sensodyne make a very good SLS free toothpaste. Dental loss is, is a real problem in Sjögren syndrome. You lose um, your teeth for two reasons. Firstly, you get gum disease. And secondly, you get dental decay itself. Um, both of them are more prevalent in patients with Sjögren's. And the reason for that is that the saliva is really important. A normal, fit, healthy person will produce one and a half litres of saliva a day, um, which sounds a huge amount. And patients with Sjögren's have massively redu reduced saliva um, production. Uh, you don't even become aware that you've got a dry mouth until you've lost about 70% of your saliva production. So you'll be down to less than 500 mils a day. Now, saliva does a couple of things. First of all, it cleans your teeth. It washes stuff off your teeth. It washes between your teeth. It cleans them. It removes gubbins from your teeth. But maybe even more important, it neutralizes the acid in your mouth. So most foodstuffs, particularly fruits um, and sweet stuff, are acidic. If you eat acid foods in any shape or form, acid damages dental enamel. Now in a normal healthy person, your saliva neutralizes that acid and normal saliva not only neutralizes but it contains little calcium molecules and minerals that can actually plug the gaps in your teeth and that simply doesn't happen in Sjögren's. So it is really important that you are meticulous with your dental hygiene you do have to spend time cleaning your teeth carefully cleaning between your teeth you'll miss 40 percent of the tooth surface if you don't clean between um, and using flossing etc now there are lots of things you can get to help you electric toothbrushes are good there's they're good for a couple of reasons they've got nice small heads which means it's easy to get into crevices and nooks and crannies also they time you a good um, electric toothbrush will tell you how long you've been brushing for will give you a little buzz at two minutes and whatever so it makes you brush your teeth for the right length of time you can get water picks for between teeth, but you can also get interdental sticks and, and little tiny teepee brushes, which can help. And if you're struggling, ask your dentist for help and ask your hygienist for help. They know about Sjögren's. They will know more about Sjögren's probably than your average GP, and they'll be able to advise you. Um, Gum disease is probably caused by a little bug called strep mutans, and that's allowed to proliferate in people with um, Sjögren syndrome. And you can also get thrush, and I'm going to talk about that on the next few slides, as well as a little bit more about the, um, the uh, bugs in the mouth. So your normal healthy mouth actually does contain lots of bugs. So my mouth will contain more than 700 different types of bacteria, but they're all in balance, and the good bugs outstrip the bad bugs in most situations. Unfortunately, in a dry mouth you can get overgrowth of something called streptococcus mutans and that's the bug that causes gum disease um, and it can cause inflammation of the gums and in extreme cases loosening of the teeth and you can lose good teeth because you've got gum disease if you're not careful and you can also get thrush and there are two particular types of thrush that we see in Sjögren's patients the more classical type on the left is where you get flaky white patches which can sometimes be confused with geographic tongue that came up as one of the questions earlier but more difficult to treat um, and more severe is this awful red or erythematous thrush, sometimes, sometimes called complex thrush. And that's where the, the candidal infection is more deep-seated and much harder to get rid of. In simple thrush, you could probably clear that with nice statin mouthwashes and sometimes the use of something called dactarin gel, which is particularly useful for the corners of the mouth. But if you've got the red raw mouth, you're probably going to need something called fluconazole to shift that. And fluconazole is is an, a prescribable antifungal treatment. The nystatins and dactarins, I think you can get over the counter, but you'd have to see your GP or your dentist for fluconazole to treat the more complex forms of thrush. And we've mentioned already that saliva contains bicarbonate, which gives it its alkaline um, and phosphate, which is its mineral content. And all of that means that your mouth is normally at pH 7, which is neutral. Those of you who remember um, chemistry lessons from a kid will know that low pH is acidic and high pH is alkaline. And in the middle, pH 7 is neutral. And neutral is where you should be in, in, in ideally and in health. 
um, and saliva normally neutralizes the acids. If you can get your teeth into a constant neutral environment, they don't lose mineral and you shouldn't get progressive decay. So that's why it's so important to look after them carefully. We've mentioned how important it is to keep them clean and here are some of the things that you can use, floss and interdental brushes and an electric toothbrush. Um, another little trick is to switch to something called xylitol. Xylitol is an, a sweetener. Um, it, I was about to call it an artificial sweetener, but actually that's not true. It's from birch tree, so it's actually a natural sweetener. Um, it's got a really interesting effect on Streptococcus mutans, and it inhibits that particular bug. And in fact, um, there have been a couple of studies, actually in the US, looking at children um, and showing that if you give children xylitol-containing sweets and pastels, they have less dental decay than their, um, their peers. Um, and it, it, it's not just the fact that xylitol replaces sugar it actually has a positive effect on the mouth and that it inhibits the streptococcus mutans that causes gum disease so i would uh, encourage you to switch to xylitol if you can you can buy it in the sugar um, aisle at supermarkets and just use it um, instead of sugar in cooking and baking and tea and whatever you use uh, it's very sweet so you need a tiny tiny little pinch and um, it's safe for diabetics um, there are some commercially available sweets and chewing gums. So a lot of the Wrigley's chewing gums, if you read the packets, contain xylitol. There's also xylimelt, which I'm sure some of you will have um, tried. There's a picture on a later slide, uh, which are little pastels that stick between your gum and your cheek and slow release xylitol in your mouth. And the only downside to xylitol that I've been able to find is that it's toxic to dogs, so you can't give, um, give it to your dog. <laughs> um, saliva also contains... Um, enzymes that digest your food um, and help break down the food and of course they're missing in patients um, with Sjogren's syndrome as well um, and they, it also contains mucins um, which can coat the teeth and the lining of the mouth uh, and make a difference and um, one of the reasons for giving you this long list is to say that if you can tolerate pilocarpine and produce your own saliva then you'll get some of this back the artificial saliva simply don't contain this degree of goodies if you like so worth trying pilocarpine if you can, if you possibly can and there are a few other things that you can do to try and stimulate your own saliva so some patients find that even if they've got a very dry mouth if they chew sugar-free gum they will produce some saliva and the reason for that is that when you're sat resting and not doing anything or just chatting, most of the saliva production is from what we call your minor salivary glands. We actually will have six major glands, two in our cheeks, two under our tongue, and two under our chin. But we have 600 minor glands lining the whole of the inside of the mouth and the oral cavity. When you're sat down at rest, it's the minor glands that produce saliva. But the minute you start chewing, your parotid glands, the big ones in your cheeks, come into action and they produce more saliva. So chewing can actually stimulate saliva function. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a simple thing to do. And, and there's a couple of other things that can stimulate it as well. Acupuncture, interestingly, can stimulate it. And so can um, a TENS machine called um, Sally Pen, which I'll show you a picture of later on. Fluoride is really important. Please don't switch to a fluoride free toothpaste because the fluoride in toothpaste is really vital for healthy, strong teeth. It, it gets built into the enamel, light, glossy enamel on the outside of your teeth, and actually that can help them repel acids. It binds to the calcium and keeps calcium in the mouth ready to repair the enamel so when you brush your teeth in the evening don't spit the the toothpaste out or spit as little out as you can and certainly don't rinse it out this is one of the reasons the dentist no longer say to use mouthwash directly after brushing because you want to maintain as much fluoride in your mouth as you can and fluoride is also antibacterial to the mouth um, and, and can help get rid of some of those bad bugs just one little point to be aware of and this is why you're told not to brush your teeth um, after eating is that if your mouth is acidic which it often is after you've eaten a meal um, the fluoride can pull the calcium out of your teeth so it can be counterproductive if you brush too soon after a meal so I talked a little bit about, about, about fluoride if you're looking for fluoride I would try and have a high fluoride toothpaste there's a number of them on the market most of the um, Oral-B and Sensodyne ranges and Colgate ranges now have good levels of fluoride in. I'd look for a fluoride content of at least a thousand parts per million. Some of you may be on prescribed fluoride toothpaste and Durafat is the classical one um, and that comes in two strengths, um, two and a half or five thousand parts per million. Um, 
it is very good it has to come on prescription because there are some dangers to very very high fluoride so it has to be prescribed by a dentist or doctor um, one thing to be aware of though is that Durafat does contain SLS so some of you may not be able to tolerate it something like the Sensodyne full protection is SLS free and if you um, use your Google search engine you'll be able to work out which ones are SLS free and you should become an avid reader of labels in supermarkets because you can work out which ones are SLS free if you do that um, some patients will have tried tooth mousse. This is very good. It's quite hard to get and you have to order it on online. You can't just buy it anymore. And it's got something called recalident on it, which is um, a sort of almost like a sealant for the teeth. And it can be very good to reduce sensitivity and seal little fissures in the teeth. Um, and dentists are very keen on it. Um, and in fact, some dentists may well have recommended it to you. As I mentioned, chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine um, is normally sold as corsodil and it's a, um, an antibacterial mouthwash. It is used for gum disease and it does kill off the strep mutans bacteria. One problem with it, though, is that it stains your teeth a sort of brownish colour. That stain can be um, polished off by your dentist, so it's not a permanent stain. But if you're worried about staining, there is a, a version called Curacept available now, which is a non-staining version of chlorhexidine. Um, and they do recommend you should use at, leave at least 30 minutes between using your toothpaste and using the chlorhexidine. Have a break between them. Don't use it immediately afterwards. In terms of your diet, there are things you can do with your diet. Um, avoid acidic foods and avoid very high sugar content foods. If you're going to eat anything sugary, eat it within a meal, not, in, not between a meal. And eating between meals is really a bit of a no-no for patients with Sjogren's because every time you eat, your mouth becomes acidic. Your mouth um, can withstand so many acid attacks a day but not too many so if you eat three times a day that's fine if you up that to five or six times a day with snacks that's a problem try and have foods that are alkaline um, arginine is particularly good for that and arginine is in spinach so spinach and that type of food is often, is often very good for people with um, with dry mouths and, and tooth decay and by all means have fruit it's good for you but don't have fruit juices and the reason for that is when they pulp the fruit to make the fruit juices they release the acids and it's the acids that damage your teeth if you eat an apple or an orange or a piece of fruit that's whole you don't get the same degree of acidity or damage to your teeth um, another little trick is to try um, use bicarbonate or baking soda. But bicarbonate is a naturally alkaline substance. You can put a pinch in drinking water um, and that can make it um, alkaline, it can make it better for you. And you can make your own mouthwash and some people would even add it to toothpaste. Just um, touch the, um, the damp, slightly damp toothpaste, toothbrush into a little sort of um, teaspoon of bicarb when they brush their teeth. And I know that there are some um, toothpaste that actually naturally have bicarbonate in them. I think the Arm and Hammer ones um, do that. Um, oops, Daisy, sorry. Pilocarpin we've already mentioned. Xylemelts I've mentioned to you as well, and that's what they look like. Um, and they can be ordered on the internet or got from a good chemist. This is something called the Salipen. One or two of you may have tried this. Actually, we... Um, we were part of a trial here where I work at the Great Western, um, looking at the use of a salipen um, in patients with Sjogren's syndrome. And it kind of works on the acupuncture principle. We do know that acupuncture can stimulate saliva in patients with Sjogren's syndrome, albeit very temporarily. And the idea was to try and give a little tiny little electrical stimulus to the glands to make them provoke and, and produce some saliva. Now, the, the trial has never um, yet been um, fully analyzed. And, I, and unfortunately, I don't have what we call the unblinded data. What I do know is that some patients on the trial did very well and some did less well. So um, that may be because 50% of people on the trial got a sham machine, a ship machine that didn't work, or it may just be that it's a random process, but some people do find it beneficial. There are anecdotal reports. It is expensive. You do have to buy it yourself if you want to try it. Um, and we are talking around about the £150 mark. So by all means, if, if you want to give it a go, do, but I can't give you any definitive um, evidence that it works, yes or no, at the present time. In terms of lifestyle, there is some evidence that you can make a difference. So um, omega-3 
which is found naturally in oily fish, um, is, is, a, is an anti-inflammatory food component. So it actually damps down inflammation. There's also some evidence that it improves tear quality. So it's worth a try. You probably need to eat a fair bit to make a difference. So that um, we normally recommend that if you can manage it, you're having two grams of omega-3 supplements a day. And a standard omega-3 supplement tablet is normally 500. Some of the higher strength ones are a gram each. Um, if you eat a lot of oily fish, so if you're having oily fish three times a week, you probably don't need to supplement your diet, but not many people manage that too much. Calcium is very important. Calcium is important for strong teeth and strong bones. Um, be aware that calcium is really only in dairy products. It's hard to get good amounts of calcium if you're dairy free. If you are dairy free, make sure that the dairy free milk you're using is supplemented with calcium. Um, consider eating fish. If you don't already eat fish, that's quite good for calcium or take supplements if you're really struggling. And vitamin D is important. Vitamin D is really important at the moment because some of you may have heard that there is some evidence that vitamin D may help um, you cope with COVID. Um, and what we do know is that 30% of the UK population are, are vitamin D deficient in the winter months. Um, and although vitamin D is regarded as the sunshine vitamin, so um, sunshine on your skin causes vitamin D and production release, we know that in the winter months, the sun insofar as we ever see it, um, it's just simply not strong enough to make um, vitamin D. So most of us should be on vitamin D supplementation in the winter months. Um, and some of us should take it all year round, particularly if you're avoiding sunshine because of skin rashes or you don't go out much or if you've got dark skin or because for cultural reasons you're very covered up. The next thing to say is exercise. Now there is very good evidence that being fit helps you fight off infections. It also helps fatigue. And there is this um, deconditioning concept um, that we've, we're seeing more and more of, actually. We've seen a lot of it during lockdown. A real big problem in lockdown is that people who have been stuck at home have been doing less exercise. Um, I think there's some terrifying statistic that the average UK adult takes less than 10 minutes physical exercise a day, which is a little bit scary. We should all be doing 30 minutes of exercise per day. Now, exercise to a doctor doesn't mean running a marathon or doing star jumps. What it means is that you should be doing something that gets your heart rate up for at least 30 minutes a day. Now, if you're very sedentary and haven't taken exercise for a long time, that's a big ask. So I would recommend if you're in that category, you start very low, maybe with five or even 10 minutes a day to start with building yourself up. But for most of us, a brisk walk, swinging your arms will get your heart rate up. And if you imagine doing that for half an hour a day, that's all we're asking of you to improve your fitness levels. We've seen a lot of deconditioning, um, obviously in the patients who've had COVID and that's been a big worry. And there's been um, a study that has looked at muscle loss in these patients. And what they've shown is that lying in bed, whether that's from COVID or anything, you lose 2% of your muscle mass every day. So, you know, in 10 days, you've lost 20%. And that is scary. Um, and, you know, somebody who lies in bed for three weeks because of illness will not be able to walk at the end of that three weeks. So that's how, how rapidly you can lose that muscle mass and how important it is that we all stay active. Um, sleep is another issue. I know that lots of patients with Sherman struggle to sleep well partly because they're probably waking up with a dry mouth or, constant, or maybe because they've drunk an awful lot, they're waking up to, to use the loo. Um, it is important you get a good amount of sleep. Bear in mind that we all need a bit less sleep as we get older. Um, babies and teenagers definitely need more sleep. So if, you, if any of you are the mums or, or parents of grumpy teenagers, you'll know that they do need a bit more sleep than average. But adults, particularly as we get older, need less, less sleep. You shouldn't worry if you only sleep for six hours or whatever a night, as long as you feel Feel that's enough for you but it is important to get back into a routine with sleep i see people who've got very disturbed sleep patterns and are very unhappy as a consequence because if you're not sleeping well you'll find it a real struggle to face the day and you'll be very tired it is important you set a bedtime and a get up time. So if you decided that you need your eight hours a night, you're going to go to bed at 10 o'clock, then you need to get up at six or eight or whatever works for you but always stick to it even if you feel you've only just gone to sleep get up because getting into a routine is really important again those of us who've been parents will know how important it is to get children into a sleep pattern and actually we forget about that as adults because you can lose your sleep pattern very easily so working on it helps there are some online resources you can get to help yourself um, and i know that versus arthritis produces some leaflets on it as well Sunshine's important, probably 
in part because of the vitamin D, but we all do need a bit of sunshine. And actually, if I could encourage you all to get outdoors for half an hour a day, that would really help your long-term health. So healthy body and mind. Um, we've talked about the body a little bit. I'm a great fan, those of you who know me, of Pilates. Um, but also of other things as well. I've recently got into spinning. That's great exercise. You don't have to go anywhere. It's very easy to do. Um, it's a nice exercise to do on a cold, wet day when you don't want to go outside. But it, whatever you choose, try and choose something you quite enjoy because that's important. I know it's difficult at the moment because I, I personally like going to classes and you can't really go to a class, but Zoom is a great um, tool. You can go to Zoom classes um, or you could set yourself a little challenge. Um, the other thing that has been shown to help um, not just Sjogren's but most rheumatic diseases is mindfulness um, and that's a simple technique to learn it's about living in the moment um, it's got some links with meditation and so forth if you've never tried it I would encourage you to give it a go um, there are lots of online um, tutorials on how to do it um, booklets if you need to help um, and you can even do an online class um, depending on the, on the area you're in but there is very good evidence it helps fatigue and well-being in patients with chronic disease so my take-home messages are um, try and prevent damage so we cannot do anything about damage what you need to do is make sure you don't get damaged in the first place and the two organs that take the brunt of the damage in Sjogren's your eyes and your teeth so look after your eyes and look after your teeth use the moisturizing eye drops frequently but don't forget the oily meibomian glands most people forget about those don't forget your eye compresses clean your teeth very carefully twice a day try and avoid eating between meals and stay fit and healthy so thank you very much that's all i was going to say i think i should probably stop sharing is that correct um yes yeah yeah, yeah. Now? <laughs> now i can see you can you still see me or hear I me can at least? See it, yes. perfect okay yeah. so um do you do you have you been keeping an eye on the chat I have, yes, we perfect. Have, we have we've had a lot of on the chat and also on whatsapp because we've had maximum, okay maximum okay. capacity for the webinar so okay 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 um, so is pilocarpine over the counter or prescription no pilocarpine has to come on prescription it is the one drug you will need your doctor's help with um some gps are a bit nervous about prescribing it it's a very old-fashioned drug not a difficult drug um just old-fashioned um I prescribe a lot of it. So patients who've seen me will know I use a lot of it and I often recommend it. But you do have to get it on prescription. Okay. Um, Claire says she has a plug-in iPad that warms up and has a timer and temperature control. Is that oh, okay to use? That sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds posh. That sounds, it just sounds posh. Yes, I usually say to patients to buy the 9.99 ones from, uh, from, from Amazon. But if you've got one of those, that's fantastic. There are some really, really beautiful ones on the market. Absolutely. Yeah, if you treat yourself, why not? Okay. Do you know of any gum that is flavour free and does not burn like meat? Oh, f flavour free. Now that is a real difficulty because all of the commercial ones are mostly mint flavoured and some people really dislike them. I think Holland and Barrett do some sort of aniseedy ones and things like that. The only thing we ever did manage to get, we had some um, wax that we used for a study that was literally you just chewed this piece of wax and one or two people really liked that because it had no flavor at all but unfortunately we, we contacted the manufacturers and said cool we actually get some and they said no they no longer made it it was just made for the study so i'm really sorry but there's nothing i can i can um recommend that does the same job um and you may not fancy this but i know as the other thing that we do in the studies is we sometimes get people to chew a piece of sponge um, and I know it sounds it sounds yeah, but but the reason for that is that it's a stimulant and it's it's a you know as long as you don't swallow it for heaven's sake but it does to stimulate so what they do in the studies is they give them a little piece of sponge they get them to chew and then you spit it out and weigh it to see if it's absorbed any moisture so some people might find that helpful but you know this is all slightly you know modern <laughs> kind of yeah make do and mend I suspect yeah um, you talked about vitamin D. What is the optimum daily dose? So um, for replacement, so your standard um, vitamin D replacement will be between 10 and 20 micrograms a day. 
um, the equivalent in international units, because some bottles have it in different different amounts, is 400 to 800 international units a day. Now, the over-the-counter stuff, so Boots Standard, or any other company, not just Boots, standard over-the-counter vitamin D would be 10 micrograms. Their high-dose vitamin D, I think, is 25. It's very difficult to overdose on it, but I would say that in general, um, I would say for most of the year, 10 micrograms is enough. If you're worried in the winter, I take 20 or 25. Um, some people will be on something called um, Calcios or Acrete or Calfervit, which are prescribable um, calcium vitamin D supplements that the GPs often give out. And those contain per tablet 400 international units or 10 micrograms. So if you're on two of those, you're getting 20 micrograms a day, which is plenty enough. Okay. Yeah. Can anything be done for someone who has Sjogren's that is affecting their central nervous system? They have very bad small fiber neuropathy. Yeah, so neuropathies are difficult. So neuropathies are very difficult. It's a, it is a complica complicated and, and relatively uncommon, but nonetheless um, disturbing um, consequence of Sjogren's. Now, all different parts of the nervous system can be affected in Sjogren's. And sometimes if it's central nervous or it's major nervous system, people get given steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs small fiber however probably doesn't respond very well to steroids or any of those treatments now pragmatically there are two things that i do that lots of doctors will do one is i take the view that if it's being caused by the sjogren's you should try and treat the sjogren's to slow it down so i would give people hydroxychloroquine which is the only routinely available treatment to slow down Sjogren's. The second thing is that there are some medications you can take to help the symptoms of small fiber neuropathy. Now there's downsides to this as well because the standard drugs that we use are drugs like amitriptyline or gabapentin or duloxetine. They're all drugs that damp down the nerve fibers, which is great because they can help the pain, but many of them will cause the dryness or make the dryness worse. So you have to weigh up the benefits of these drugs. So some patients will say, well, actually the pain from the small fiber is bad. I'll take amitriptyline. It makes me drier, but I'll drink more and I'll take more pilocarpine. So you have to balance up what, what's the worst problem for you. Not easy, I think it's fair to say. Okay. Um are Chauvin sufferers more likely to get shingles than others if they are on immunosuppressants? Um, I don't think they're definitely more likely. I mean, shingles is a pretty awful condition. It tends to attack patients who are very run down. I don't think you're any more likely than anyone else on immunosuppressants, but yes, you are likely to get it if you're on immunosuppressants and run down. Um, some people with really bad shingles or recurrent um, herpes, which is a, a link, you know, it's the same, same family of viruses, would take regular acyclovir, which is an antiviral treatment, and that's something you can talk to your GP about. There's a, a few people would be eligible for the shingles vaccine, but it's very limited. I I think you've got to be between a certain age between 70 and 80 they don't give it to the over 80s um, and uh, there is some evidence that reduces the frequency of attacks okay is pilocarpine good and how does it help with vaginal dryness well, it, in theory, pilocarpine helps dryness everywhere because all it does, it's a very, very basic drug. It, it looks for something called muscarinic receptors and all our secretory glands have got muscarinic receptors on them. So in theory, yes. But for vaginal dryness, we often, I didn't cover that really in the talk, but, but we often do recommend specific vaginal moisturizers. Now, I, I mentioned in the talk that the mouth is normally alkaline or neutral. A healthy vagina is acidic. So you need acid um, moisturizers. So you, do, you can't just slap anything down there. And there's a couple of good ones on the market, YesVM, Hyalafem, Replens. There was an article some years ago that we had in the magazine on vaginal dryness. And I don't know if, yeah, you may still have some copies of that. So that might be worth looking back if you've got any of those. Okay, pilocarpine has also been asked about in relation to sinusitis. So we've got... Well, so dry sinuses are part of Sjogren's, yes. Now, sinusitis and dry sinuses are different things. So dry sinuses, yes, I can imagine pilocarpine would help. <clears throat> if you've got sinusitis, mm. actual inflammation in the sinuses, you may need something to damp that down. So that's a slightly different problem. Okay. Um, does sea buckthorn oil help? So sea buckthorn has got omega-7 in it. So omega-7, um, there was at least one small study showing it helped tear quality. It's not as good as omega-3, but you might want to take both. 
I think omega-7 has the advantage of being vegetarian though, whereas I think omega-3 is usually um, fish derived, isn't it? So some people struggle with that a bit. Um, what evidence is there for links between Sjogren's and gut health problems? So, so, so there's quite a lot of interest at the moment in gut health um, in the medical world. So the, the, all of us have bugs in our gut. And, um, and the, the sort of medical term for that is the, is the microbiome or the gut biome. And the evidence is that your bugs in your gut are pretty stable, probably from early childhood. So from about seven or eight years of age, your, your gut bugs are stable. You tend to have gut bugs that are more like the people you physically live with than your genetic relatives. So, you know, if, you, if you've moved in with your partner and lived them with a few years, your gut bugs will become more like them than it would be like your parents, if you see what I mean. And most people's gut bugs or biome are in a, um, a balanced, it's a bit like the mouth bugs, they're in a balance good versus bad and the good ex exceed the bad now the commonest thing that upsets gut bugs is antibiotics and antibiotics definitely strip out the good bugs as well as the bad bugs so very often after a course of antibiotics it upsets the bugs in the gut and there are two or three consequences of that first of all you can get thrush you can get candida because they that allows overgrowth of candida. So in an ideal world to treat candida, you'd have a course of treatment for the candida, but you'd also rebalance your gut biome or your mouth biome. And there are simple ways of doing that. So you can take um, live yogurts um, and Yakult type things, and you, you can even get um, gut bug supplements, can't you? So you can take all of these supplement things. Um, the other consequence is that, it, it, and this is usually something we only see in hospitals in very sick patients, is you can get a really unpleasant infection called Clostridium which is where a really unpleasant gut bacteria takes over and that can cause awful diarrhea and can be really debilitating but that's usually in frail patients who've had lots of antibiotics in hospitals. Is Sjogren's syndrome related to a drop in estrogen levels as we age? Um, well it's commoner in women so there must be some link to estrogen. Um, I think what happens is I don't think that's because we, we see we we see um, Sjogren's in teenagers and we see it in young adults. So I think and they've got very high estrogen levels. So I don't think it's the fall in estrogen levels. I think there's a couple of things though. As we get older, yes, our estrogen levels fall, and just having low estrogen levels causes dryness. So if you've already got dryness from your Sjogren's and then your estrogen levels fall, that can um, make the dryness worse. There's also some evidence that. And we also have testosterone in our systems. And, um, you know, e even normal women will have a level of testosterone and testosterone levels fall as well. And that can make you drier. So it's probably the balance of hormones as you get older that contributes to it. OK, is Chauvin syndrome related to POTS? So POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Now, POTS is an autonomic problem. And POTS is seen in a number of different conditions. So it's seen in people who are deconditioned. So people who've had a profound illness and become very deconditioned can get POTS as part of that. Mm -hmm. And it's also seen in a few unusual autonomic conditions. Now, I, it's, I, I have certainly seen patients with Sjogren's, with autonomic neuropathy and with POTS. Yeah, so definitely they're linked. And, but it isn't common. Um, and the treatment for POTS depends on the actual underlying cause. Um, but in most people in Sjogren's, it's usually pretty mild. Now, that's a, that's a generalization because it isn't always. But in the general patient with Sjogren's, the POTS side of things is mild. And they get a little bit of a postural drop when they stand up, a little bit of heart racing. And you can manage that by um, keeping the salt levels up in the diet. Using support stockings actually helps. And just being sensible, so not leaping out of bed, sort of sitting on the edge for a few minutes and letting your heart rate and your blood pressure settle before you stand up. Um, there are a few people who've got severe POTS, and that's a different end of the spectrum. And as to say there are lots of things with that but deconditioning is a factor in POTS so whatever the cause a bit like a lot of things but like most chronic diseases improving your fitness levels does definitely help okay um somebody's asking why does water make my mouth more dry um, I'm not sure I suppose it probably depends on maybe it might depend on the pH of your, water, of your mouth I suppose water isn't awfully refreshing actually it's a funny concept isn't it um most people find tea more refreshing than water, don't they? Um, <clears throat> some people suck ice cubes. It might be to do with the pH. 
Um, it might be because water, um, and obviously it might be because it's acid. Some some mineral waters are, are quite acidic, actually, um, and particularly if you're having fizzy or flavoured water. Um, so I think it, it may just be, you know, that you perceive it as drying. Um, interestingly, again, those of you who were at the meeting in Newcastle a couple of years ago will remember there was a fantastic talk by a girl called Jette, Jette Holbrook, who was a dentist, and she recommended putting a pinch of xylitol and a pinch of bicarbonate into um, your drinking water. And she said that made it much more refreshing and much more palatable. Uh, and I think it's something a few patients have tried. So it's a very simple thing to do and worth a go. We do actually have that as a handout if anybody Yes, yes, that's, that's a good one. Yes, if patients want to request that, good. And um, somebody's asking whether you know anything about the blue screen that opticians recommend for an iPhone or a mobile phone use. Do you know how they actually work? I suspect it's a glare reducing thing. So it's interesting. I was in an eye, I do an eye clinic once a month with a guy called Mr. Smith, Guy Smith, and he's great, great, a great source of information. And we had a patient complaining about dazzle the other day. And he said that having a poor tear film gives you dazzle. Mm. And, and and it's all to do with the wave uh, of the so if you look at your, a normal healthy eye you've got a film of tears on it so, uh, and in a normal person when you blink that film of tears will last a good 10 seconds now a couple of things about the tear film i didn't know which i think are quite fascinating first of all your tear film is made by your top lid going down and dragging the um the fluid the tears up and that's why when you're looking at a screen, you get dry eyes. Because when you're concentrating on a screen, you don't blink properly. You don't do a full blink. Your eyes don't go all the way down and back up. So one of the tricks if you're looking at a screen and you get dry eyes is to, is, to, is to close them properly and then open back up to get that full tear film effect. But what we know in Sjogren's is <clears throat> that tear film breaks up very quickly. So in someone like myself or in Sarah, our tear film should last a good 10 seconds or more. In Sjogren's, it often only lasts about three seconds and it disperses. And that dispersed tear film can give you dazzle. Um, and I think the blue filter is probably to try and reduce that dazzle, I suspect. Does having a BMI over 25 contribute to Sjogren's symptoms? Um, I don't know. Most of my Sjogren's patients are actually quite slim because they don't eat and all, you know, because food's not as much fun for them anymore. So I think a lot of people struggle to keep their weight up. Um, now, there are a few odds and ends that go with having a BMI, high BMI, maybe not specific to Sjogren's, but we know people with a high BMI do you have low level inflammation? So having a high BMI can drive inflammation. So that may not help. It's also not, not great for your joints. The, the joint that really d dislikes weight is the knee, actually. Most of our joints are pretty robust. Hips are incredibly robust, but knees aren't for some reason. And knees really struggle with weight. Um, <clears throat> And there is a concept, there is, there is something funny to do with hormones. So some of the girls who have polycystic ovary syndrome, if they've got a high BMI, <coughs> they get estrogen conversion to testosterone in their fatty tissues. And that's not great either. So I'm not sure it directly contributes to Sjogren's, but it can cause other things that might make Sjogren's harder to live with. Um, can Sjogren's cause tremors? No, I don't think it can actually, but <laughs> I, that's one I haven't come across. So um, tremors are quite common. Um, the commonest type of tremor is something called benign essential tremor. Uh, that often runs in families, particularly in the female side, um, and people have a very fine tremor, um, which is, or can be helped by beta blockers if, if you need them, but I don't think it's particularly linked to Sjogren's. Okay, um, I have celiac disease and Hashimoto's plus joint hypermobility syndrome. Is this quite common? So celiac is linked to Sjogren's, definitely yes. So celiac um, in the normal population affects about one in 300, I think is about the normal, um, and about one in 40 Sjogren's patients have it. So it's definitely commoner in Sjogren's, yes. Hashimoto's is a thyroid condition, and that's autoimmune. And yes, that is commoner in Sjogren's. In fact, autoimmune diseases tend to cluster together. And we know that about one in five people with Sjogren's will get a thyroid disorder at some point. They won't all get Hashimoto's, but they'll get some form of thyroid disease. The one that isn't linked is the hypermobility. That's bad luck, I think, to have that with it. Okay, and we're getting a lot of questions about the vaccine, Liz. Um, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so, 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 have it. so if you're offered a vaccine, the answer is yes, please have it. So the vaccines um, are safe. So the, um, the first one that came out, the Pfizer vaccine, is an mRNA vaccine. 
Um, I know people are worried about it replicating in their cells, but it is designed to get into your cells, replicate the spike proteins, that's the surface proteins on the, on the virus, and then die off. So you'll get the spike proteins, but you will not get the rest of it stuck into you forever. Um, and it definitely works. Um, <clears throat> personal experience, I've had the first dose because as a front, frontline healthcare worker, um, I was absolutely fine. If someone had said to me, is your arm sore? I'd have said, oh yeah, maybe for the first 24 hours. Um, but really it caused minor side effects. Now I'm not gonna get my second dose for three months, but a few of my colleagues had the second dose because they had it earlier in the, in, in, in the rollout. And mm -hmm. they said the second dose made them feel a bit achy and run down. So I think because they had an immune response, they all felt a bit, a bit fluey for 24 hours, but minor problems. The other vaccine, the Oxford um, vaccine, which is just being launched, which is actually the one that most of us will get because mm -hmm. the Pfizer one's a really difficult vaccine. It's got to be stored at minus 80, which means it's really hospitals only. So we're giving it to our hospital inpatients, but it's unlikely to get into GP land anytime soon. So you're more likely to get the Oxford one. They've got 100 million doses. So that's the one they're rolling out. Um, and actually, although it is a adenovirus, it is an adenovirus which is designed not to replicate, so it is absolutely safe. There was unfortunately somebody, I don't know, I think people have seen this on, the, uh, on BBC News 24, who said that immunosuppressed patients shouldn't have it. That is wrong, mm. absolutely wrong. The British Society of Rheumatology has come out, all the vaccine people have come out and said this is nonsense. Unfortunately, it hasn't been retracted as a statement, but it is safe and you should have it. And it's safe even if you're on immunosuppressive drugs. The only slight issue with it is if you're on very immunosuppressive drugs, so we're talking about high dose steroids or a drug called rituximab, it's safe to have, but you may have less effect from it because your body may not produce quite so many antibodies. Mm -hmm. And there's been a bit of a chat about how we're gonna get around that. The, the general view is that you should still have it. So even if you maybe only get a 70 or 80% uh, cover, it's better than none. Um, but also it may be something to do with the timing. So they're currently recommended that if you're on rituximab, which one or two patients will be, you have the vaccine at least four weeks away from your rituximab infusion to give yourself time for your antibody response to recover. Okay. Regarding the vaccines, I've got a number of people saying about their allergies to penicillin. No, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. There's no penicillin in it. It's perfectly safe. So in the original rollout, two healthcare workers who had a history of anaphylaxis to vaccines had a, had a reaction. Both of them had mild reactions. Both of them have gone on to have the second vaccine. So the view is that it, it's not an issue. Okay, um, and a final question is just about using skin products. Have you got any advice on skin products at all? So, yeah, so you want to use, I mean, the trouble is it's all very personal skin products. Mm. You just have to find what suits you is the honest answer. You probably want to avoid anything that's highly perfumed. Um, and I think if you're using face products and so forth, um, you probably, if you want to use them day by day, want to have something with a bit of sun protection in it because sun ra induced rashes are a big issue in Sjogren's syndrome. I think it's a very personal thing. You've just got to use what works for you. Um, and you know, not it may take a little while to get the one that works best for you, but it's probably worth spending a little bit more money maybe on something a little bit nicer, asking for it as a Christmas present, that sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, and the last final question that's popped up is just about a connection with food intolerances and Sjogren's syndrome. Yeah, so, so the one definite one is the gluten. So we do know there's an association with gluten intolerance or celiac disease. Mm. <clears throat> and we find true celiac in about one in 40. Now, even um, those who don't have, there's a blood test you can have for celiac disease these days, which is quite accurate. So even in those where the, where the blood test is fine, they often still report feeling more comfortable if they keep away from gluten, some patients. So I think some people are gluten intolerant. And I've got a few people who are a bit lactose intolerant. I think it is difficult. The gut is often involved in Sjogren's in that it's dry. Um, and we also have a problem with lots of people complaining of slow transit. Things take ages to get from top to bottom end, as it were. So, um, uh, you have to be a bit careful with what you eat and sometimes it's a question of trial and error so I think yeah I think people are often a bit intolerant of food things but there's no apart from the celiac the gluten there's no specific association okay and I think we've covered all the questions there so perfect timing okay. we've got the end of the hour so thank Good. you well done oh, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you to everyone for joining us today thanks a lot okay thanks bye <laughs> bye <laughs>